I'm Amy, sex educator, sex and relationship coach, and co-owner of PurePleasureShop.com. I'm April, VP of the cutting-edge sex toy company Hot Octopus, and I dedicate my life to the business of sex. We are on a mission to teach you how to have hot sex, deep intimacy, and how to make your own rules for who you are as a sexual being. Welcome Welcome to to the the Shameless Sex Revolution. Don't forget to head on over to our website, shamelesssex.com, for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com. You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Well, hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Well, that's when this is released. So It's Tuesday right now. Oh, it's Tuesday when we're recording. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Happy Tuesday. Happy any day that ends with day. Uh-huh. Aww, all the days. I'm funny. They all blend together. They all do. All blending together. We did a lot today. This was a busy day for us. It was, for sure. Today, we uh, worked on a project that we cannot talk about yet, but it's involved sex ed. That was exciting. Then we did a podcast with Holly Randall, Unfiltered. That was a good podcast. And then we're we cleansing. And we're cleansing, so no wine. That's challenging, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. It's fun to podcast in wine. Yeah, it's totally fun. We actually were like, I think we're more fun when we're on wine. Now we're just <laughs> whining about not having wine. <laughs> Why not? So there's still whining going yeah, on. Yeah, there's wine. whining, but it's not it's the wine form. Yeah, plenty of wine. So this episode is with Dr. Rhoda Lipscomb on the seven guidelines for great relationships. I love when people have things narrowed down to guidelines. And in this very clear, concise, of course, it's not one size fits all, but things that everyone can maybe apply to their relationships should they choose to. It's for all types of folks in relationships. You're not in a relationship. You probably will be someday. I took notes during this interview with her and like put them on my phone and then sent them to a couple of people like, oh my God, this was amazing. And yeah, stay tuned. It's really, it's a great interview. Yeah, I'm excited to listen to it again because she had some really good key points. Uh, And our listeners love anything about sexual mastery and also how to uh, be the best partner in a relationship possible. Before we dive in, see, I made that noise. That's new. I don't know where that came from. I haven't really noticed, but now I'm gonna now you up. Notice every time Maybe you see I need it, to do a <laughs> that's my new noise. Well, that face <laughs> that came with it, if y'all could see, this is why we need to be on. I have a great face for radio. YouTube. That was such a that one. Yeah, every time you hear me go, maybe just put a finger up. And then see how many fingers we get. <laughs> all right, all right, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, this will be fun. You all can do it at home with us. <laughs> <There you> <laughs> <laughs> Quick plug for Hot Source Yoga, whom we love and cannot attend their classes in person, but Hot Source Yoga does have classes online. We, uh, see, there it was. We love Hot Source Yoga. They have Pilates. They have, <laughs> her finger just went up. Uh, <laughs> Pilates, they have yoga. And uh, right now you can take it from the privacy of your own home. You'll understand why we love Nicole. She's an amazing instructor. She also does all kinds of yoga teacher trainings. I think right now she's in the middle of a yin teacher training. And she has a online Pilates instructor class that you can take at any time. And she does coaching sessions too. Yep. If you mm-hmm. check out her. She's an amazing coach. Yeah, her, yeah. her coaching. I think we all can do some like coaching right now. Oh, no. <laughs> you not telling me. Help me. So that's hot source yoga studio.com. I forgot the word studio is in there as well. Also, I'm co-teaching a Tantra Emotion Eros Embodiment and Central Touch for Lovers online series, three-week series online, everyone. And it's in two weeks starting June 4th, also June 11th, June 18th. It is from 5.37 p.m. all online via Zoom video call. And this is for lovers. This is for couples. This is for folks who crave complete presence with every titillating movement and sensation. Or maybe you're just hungry for new creative and sexy ways to connect with your partner because we all know a lot of people could use that during these times. So this is a three-week online series with myself and the amazing Daniel Molnar. We usually teach this in person here in Santa Cruz and well now we're moving online it's all experiential it's going to potentially turn up your arousal deepen your connection give you some creative ways to spice things up Uh, so as I said three different evenings sign up ASAP because it's only $90 per couple if you sign up by May 28th and then $100 per couple after and you get to hang out with me on video not just a voice in your ear I will be now hanging out with you via the virtual 
world. So to sign up, go to danielmolner.com, D-A-N-I-E-L-M-O-L-L-N-E-R.com. There's more information on there. I hope to see you there. And also, we have another uh, fun little experiment we're going to do. We are playing clips from folks from our network. We're part of the Pleasure Podcast Network. We all made little clips with our top tips for quarantine slash shelter in place. This clip is from the American Sex Podcast. They are awesome. They are Chicago based. They have a Chicago accent. And they're sex educators. They're playful. Uh, they are also specialize in kink, but they have topics from all different uh, types of sexual preferences. So without further ado, here is a little clip. And if you like it, go check out the American Sex Podcast. I'm Sunny Megatron from American Sex Podcast. The Pleasure Podcast question of the month is, what is my number one sex tip for quarantine? My tip is don't freak out about how much sex you do or don't want right now. Stress directly affects libido. And right now your sex drive might be at zero. Or you might be one of those types that responds to anxiety and fear with increased sex drive. It even has a name, the apocalyptic hornies. So rather being all consumed with, oh my goodness, is this normal? Just take a deep breath. It's normal. You're dealing the best you can and things might be different for a while. That's perfectly okay. Sometimes just reassuring yourself of this is half the battle. If you want to hear more, check out American Sex Podcast at americansexpodcast.com. I love that accent. And good information. Great information. She's so well-spoken. She's very well-spoken. She's playful. She's educational and informative. And that Chicago accent makes me miss Chicago. That's where Uber Loop's from. I know. I want to go see I'm my Uber Loopers. Oh, when April has enough wine, you can kind of hear a little yeah. Wisconsin. Where's my man? I think you tried pretty hard to get rid of that one, didn't oh, yeah. you? Oh, yeah. Worked on it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to share some feedback. So we did the episode on circumcision. We had a sex question in the beginning of it from someone that was asking about foreskin restoration. We do not know very much of, in fact, really anything on that. And the person that was the guest didn't really know a lot about that either. So we received feedback from someone that is uh, is, is positive. They said that they were slightly disappointed that that it wasn't mentioned in the episode. So I was slightly disappointed that foreskin restoration wasn't mentioned at all in the episode. I am not sure if this... If this is an unknown phenomenon where you, with you or the speaker, geez, cannot read. To me, this should be mentioned as an option to all penis owners who have been circumcised. And I was hoping it would be mentioned when I saw the podcast topic. In short, thousands, likely many more, I can say at least thousands because of the Reddit community of men are restoring their foreskins. Basically, the skin of the penis and genital skin in general has very active mitosis, so the skin actually grows when put under gentle tension over time. Typically, this takes about five years or more depending on the severity of the cut. Some men use methods, use manual methods alone, and some use special devices. I can say from personal experience that this has been life-changing for me and has been wonderful for my sex life with partners. I don't think there is a better way to address the trauma of circumcision if it's something that bothers a man's mental or physical well-being. One can never restore certain specialized tissues once cut, like the frenulum and the ridge band, but having restoration of the normal state of the mucosa, I don't know what this word is that he just used, but it's an issue that we alluded to when mentioning the importance of the clitoral hood. And gliding action during sex and masturbation is definitely a worthwhile pursuit. Not to mention taking back control of your own body and having genitals more similar to what nature intended. Real life example for me was the inability to orgasm with oral sex or passive vaginal sex, which is now possible with increased sensitivity. I thought it was interesting that the guest mentions gentle pinching and rolling the scar line because this is very much a part of the restoration process. Hmm. And so this person, uh, I think they actually do work in the medical field, but they are, are not, this, they're like, this is not, I wrote back to them. I was like, can we share this? Because it was, I thought it was really insightful. Uh, we would love to have someone who can speak on foreskin restoration. That would be awesome. We're not shaming people who have been circumcised or want to circumcise their children. Uh, we did highlight that there are nerve endings in there that are being cut and it can affect sensitivity. And this is a good example for someone who had a hard time getting off to oral sex and passive van- vaginal sex. And through this process, we we're able to feel more. So there's just there's options out there for people and you can do more research to learn more. And hopefully we'll get someone to speak on this topic. Right. We're not comfortable any, anymore doing a, just a random fact of uh, we're not sure. Yeah. So that's why we weren't 
giving any information about yeah. about foreskin restoration because someone's called us out like sometimes they have facts and they don't even know the stats. Yeah. I'm like, this is true. I don't know these stats. I'm not an encyclopedia Britannica. No, but I find this this absolutely fascinating that you can restore tissue in this way. And yeah. and we were just doing uh Instagram live with Dolly about uh, it's more like a remediation process for scar tissue. I think there's so many things that we can do for our own healing. I wonder even. if castor oil would work with or, any of that. I don't know. That'd be I, interesting. When I, we get the professional that knows more yeah. about this. Yeah, if topic, anyone knows a professional, be, yeah. send them our way. We would love to host them on the Shameless Jokes podcast. April, would you like to read a bio in your most beautiful uh, Minnesota accent? Just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be fun. Damn it. I could. Oofta. If anybody uh, knows Oofta, <laughs> they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. Dr. Rhoda Lipscomb is a sexuality coach, certified sex therapist, and clinical sexologist with a PhD in clinical sexology. She is the author of No More Hiding, Permission to Love Your Sexual Self, an innovative guide to help people navigate the world of BDSM, kinks, fetishes, and open relationships, such as swinging and polyamory. To visit more, visit drrhoda.com. That's D-R-R-H-O-D-A.com. But first, flowers are blooming, the grass is growing, and it's time to mow your lawn. Thanks to our sponsor, Manscaped, you can trim the hedges below the belt safely and efficiently. Yes, folks, I'm talking about one of the best trimmers for your bits. Our guy friends and partners are huge fans of Manscaped's Perfect Package 3.0 kit, which comes with the essential lawnmower 3.0 trimmer and a lot of other products to round out your manscaping routine. The trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce manscaping accidents so you are less likely to nick or snag any nuts. Inside the perfect package, you'll also find the Manscaped Crop Preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant, and moisturizer. It's starting to get hot outside and this is crucial so your balls stop sticking to your leg. Penis owners, it's time to step up your game. Penis admirers, you just discovered a great gift item for your lover. And our listeners get 20% off and free shipping with the code SHAMELESS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code SHAMELESS. It's spring cleaning, baby, and your balls will thank you for it. Now, back to the show. All right, everyone. It is episode time. We are here with Dr. Rhoda Lipscomb. Did I say that right? Lipscomb? Did I say that right? Yes. Yeah, I did it. We're here to talk about the seven guidelines for great relationships. Uh, and we were just talking about this before we started recording about how right now, um, uh, some a lot of folks that I know are having a hard time in relationships because uh, they're in tight quarters with their loved ones. And, um, and sometimes that can be very confronting and challenging. And there's not a lot of mystery and newness. Uh, and for folks who are listening who are not in partnerships, there will be information for you here as well, because maybe at some point you'll want to be in some sort of lovership partnership as well. So um, let's just dive on in. Rhoda, we'd like to start with the question. Tell us about your work and how you got to where you are today in the field of human sexuality. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Um, boy, that's that's a big topic. Um I've, you know, I've really been in the field of human sexuality for about 28 years. Um, it's, it's, it's not been a straight linear line. It's been sort of one of those kind of convoluted um, type of paths. Um, and about 14 years ago, I got my master's degree um, and went into private practice and then eventually got my PhD. Um, and over all the years, I've really realized that there's just as a society, we do such a poor job of preparing people for what's a huge part of their life. We don't prepare them well for their sex lives. We don't pre prepare them well for relationships. And there's just such a huge need uh, to help people do it better. Um, and, you know, since the internet's come out, I think there's a lot more information, some of it good, some of it not so good. Um, so it can be hard to know where to turn. Mm -hmm. And the, about the last 14 years, I've really specialized a lot of my work with more of the um, sort of alternative sexuality communities, um, things like open relationships, people with kinks, fetishes, uh, things like that. 
partly just because I, well, I, I really like working with those people. Um, and also because they just, uh, they're very misunderstood, even in the psychology world. Um, unfortunately, there's still a lot of therapists who have that very rigid view about the way sex and relationships are supposed to work. Um, and I've always believed that it, your relationship doesn't have to look like anybody else's. As long as it works for the people involved in it, that's all that really matters. I had a question though, that's something that came up and I think is such a, a, an important question. First of all, just to premise it is that a lot of times in relationships, everyone talks about how important communication is. Communication, 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 right? You hear it all the time. We say that on our podcast and people, I think, tend to get almost frustrated or overwhelmed because either they don't know how to communicate or it's just an absolute challenge for them or their partners can't hear what they're saying. So then they feel like they're not being heard or understood. So the question is, why is communication so important in relationships? And why is it so challenging for a lot of people? Well, that is an excellent question because um, you do hear a lot. And oftentimes when people come in to see me, they're often like, we don't communicate well. We need to learn to communicate better. Um, and it isn't that people don't really know how to communicate. It's, it's that oftentimes what we've learned growing up comes from our family of origin. And so your, your parents, for better or for worse, are your first examples of how what you think love relationships are supposed to look like. And they give us some good examples. And unfortunately, they also give us some very bad examples. And when you're a young child, you don't know which are which. And you tend to take them in and then mirror them later, unconsciously usually. Because we don't take that time to go back and think about, well, my parents did this and they did that during this time. And Oh, that probably wasn't a real great thing, but this one was good. I should, I should, no, we just do them all. Mm -hmm. um, so it's difficult to know then, and your, your parents that you're mirroring, and then your partner's parents that they're mirroring are very different. So if one part of the couple had parents who were very expressive and loud, um, and the other one had parents that were very soft-spoken, didn't, didn't um, argue in front of their children. So they never saw their ch parents argue. They never saw their parents fight. They don't have any concept of what fighting means. So then their partner come from this loud, expressive family. And they're like, oh my God, it's the end of the world because why are we fighting? We're not supposed to fight. We're not supposed to have any conflict. Well, it's not that their parents didn't have any conflict. They just never saw it. Yeah, we are, we are such sponges and especially in those informative years when we're oh, learning yes. all these, like all we, everything that we see, we're just taking in and then you're young and you don't have the ability to decipher, you know what, oh yeah, this seems like a healthy, helpful way of communicating this. We're, you're young, you just, you take it all in. And then as adults, we now have the option, not everyone will choose to do this, but the option to start to kind of go inside and to ask the deeper questions. Like, you know, what's, what works for me? What's, what feels helpful and healthy, what's mine and is not mine, which is kind of, again, the premise of our shameless sex is to really educate people that inform them that they have all the tools inside of them and that they've, most of us has been misled and are living by other people's ideas and rules on how to do things. And then we feel stuck or we feel empty or alone, or we keep having these cycles. And when I look at all of my relationships that I've had with romantic partners, they're all so different in terms of the communication, because like you said, we're taking two different people with different wounding and upbringings and different messages and, um, and ideas about what this is supposed to look like. So my first romantic partnership with who is currently is now my best friend and we live on the same property together. We were each other's first love when we were 18. We never fought. And I'll say that there was some good beauty in that. Also, we just weren't talking about a lot of stuff. We were young. We didn't know how to. And, you know, the confrontation was scary. We both were taught that from our younger relationships. Um, second partnership was somewhat like that too, but also just like disconnected in communication in general. Um, we had we had different levels of skill in communication and comfort com and our ability to be comfortable communicating in general. I think I was a little more comfortable than he was. And then, and, and my, anyways, fast forward, my fourth relationship, lots of fighting, lots of arguing, lots of like, oh, this is hard. And, and so, and I'm just saying, this is an example of, you know, 
I, this has been very educational for me to watch how, with what you're saying, how when we take in my, take myself with another person, we switch that person, how different the communication is um, and what we're showing up with in the work that we've done. So um, I see that you created this thing called the seven guidelines for great relationships. I'm curious, this will be a question that'll probably give you a lot, a lot of time to answer. Um, how did you come up with this? And what are the guidelines uh, for great relationships? Well, I would love to take full credit for it, but I, I actually can't. Um, it it kind of comes from a number of sources. Um, the big chunk of it comes from a book called Making Intimate Connections by Albert Ellis, who was a very famous um, psychologist back in like the 1960s and 70s. I mean, he's long dead now. But I found this book in the early 2000s of his that was one of his later works. And it was just this very simple um book about these just seven different ways of making relationships work. And when when I go into it, you're going to see like, oh yeah, I I know that. And and most people, when they hear it, they're like, oh yeah, I know that stuff. The question is most of us don't do it, even though we know it. Mm -hmm. And that's the real hard part is how much of it can you take in and then actually start doing these pieces? Um, some of it also came from the work of Dr. John Gottman. I don't know if you've heard Mm -hmm. of the Gottmans. Um, so there's some of the Gottman work that got put into this as well. Um, and then other little pieces that just kind of came from not only 28 years of, of practice of, of working with people, but about 19 years of marriage, um, you know, kind of like you were saying with, you look at your previous relationships before my, my current husband, I don't think I ever had a relationship that lasted more than about two years, mm-hmm. you know, and I got to be in my late thirties. I'm like, what the hell is wrong with me? I can't, I can't keep a relationship more than two years. You know, <laughs> Is this going to be my life? And um, met him and we've been together almost 20 years and married almost 19. And I finally got to the point where I went, I am making this so much harder than it has to be, you know, and, and so I found this book and I implemented it in my own marriage and found that it really has helped a great deal. Um, and some of it is just so simple when you break it down that it's, it's kind of that, wow, why are we making this so tough? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me tell you the, the seven guidelines and then we can kind of talk about each one of them in a little bit more depth. So basically what they are is that number one is you want to accept your partner as is. Um, you're not, you're trying to avoid blame. Um, you're not trying to change them. Uh, number two is that to express appreciation frequently. Um, and then number three is to communicate from a place of integrity. Uh, number four, to share and explore differences with your partner um, and really give you a self, a safe space to do that. Um, number five is to support your partner's goals. Uh, number six is to give your partner the right to be wrong. Uh, and number seven is to reconsider your wants as goals that you may achieve later. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll get in, we'll talk about all these. Um, and I always say that the, number one is the hardest. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a hard time wanting to accept our partners for the way they are. Um, we, our society teaches us that, oh, well, you're going to fall in love with this person and then you, you change them. Like, oh, well, they're going to, there's these things about them I don't really like or that irritate me, but I'll put up with them for now and I'll change them later. Oh boy. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Yeah. Um, and it's so ingrained in our culture that we're going to change people. And we don't realize that, you know, I mean, like we have to think about it almost from ourselves. How much do we change because other people want us to? Mm-hmm. Usually not very much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Usually that tends to, to cause us to uh, dig in our heels and ad- find that stubbornness inside and be like, I'm not going to change just because you want me to change. No, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we all want to be loved for who we are. Mm-hmm. I have, and I, I think uh, for kind of interject there too. One of my my experience by having someone, a uh, past partner who was really pushing me to change. There's some good stuff. Like I did transform in a lot of ways. It gave me this drive, like in certain ways. 
And there's parts of me that completely shut down. It wasn't even like defiance or, or stubbornness. It was like complete fear. Oh, I'm not loved and accepted here. And I, and, and there, and that was not the way for me to blossom in these. It, it actually inspired me more so to pull away than to be able to grow in that department. I was thinking about this, um, Dr. Rota, when you were talking about thinking people will shift or thinking you can change them or thinking the marriage or the kids are going to help shift that person. Oh, yeah. And they think, oh, as soon as we get married, I know things are going to change. As soon as we have that baby, I think things are going to change. Oh, and no. that is something I feel it is very common. And mm-hmm. I always just want to shout out like, no, that's not going to happen, honey. No. I mean, so it, I just it could change. It just isn't necessarily going to change to make things easier. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, things will change, but not necessarily the way you want them to change. (laughs) Um, Especially if you're holding out for this hope that things are going to be better once we're married or once we have kids or once we like you hit these milestones and you think, oh, well, things are going to get better because you've hit the milestone rather than your relationship is a journey that you're in together. And if you're not enjoying the journey as it's going, Why are you on this path with this person? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, and that is a hard thing, you know, and it's different to allow yourself to influence your partner to help make them a better person. But that's, that's more of that kind of encouragement rather than you're not okay as you are, you need to be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so influencing your partner and encourage them and also letting them encourage you letting them influence you um, so that you're not coming at it from the standpoint of, well, you know, I'm perfect the way I am. You're the one who has to change. Mm-hmm. <laughs> would, would you say for folks who are single and, or dating, uh, although dating is kind of funny right now, but like uh, for your advice would be if you're getting into a relationship with someone to uh, choose them as they are and not based on who you hope they turn into? Very much so. Um you know, and sometimes in those early stages, we we accept certain things that we find amusing or endearing. And you have to go back and remember, like, there was a reason why you accepted that. Because mm-hmm. um, if years later, now it's making you crazy. Well, they haven't changed. It's just your perception about how you feel about it that has changed because it's still the same behavior. Mm-hmm. Um I, I had a couple once and she was notoriously late and he had this thing about being on time. And, you know, I looked at him one day and I mean, they've been married for 20 years, 25 years. And I'm like, why do you think this is going to change? Why do you get so upset about her being 10 minutes late when you know she's going to be 10 minutes late? She's been 10 minutes late your entire relationship. Mm-hmm. Why are you upset about it now? Mm-hmm. You know, and it was it was almost like this power struggle for him. He's like, but she knows this makes me upset, so she should do it for me. Like, it doesn't work that way. Or there's the people who take things really personally because they're like, you're doing this on purpose to piss me off. That yes. one, which I'm sure there are times when people are defiant and are actually doing that. But hey, listeners, let me tell you, that uh, to hear that from a partner never works and feels good. <laughs> like to, no. to hear you're you're hurting me intentionally. First of all, we're telling you're telling someone what their experience is. You're telling them they're they're intentionally being an asshole, um, <laughs> and isn't going to get you what you want. Ultimately, at least I mean, in my opinion, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think most of the time you're going to get what you're looking for, um, and and nobody makes us feel anything. We choose our own way of interpreting every situation. Um, And the same situation, somebody else might look at it and laugh like, oh, you're late again. Okay. Um, So you're choosing to be upset about it rather than choosing to look at it and go, okay, you're 10 minutes late. Um, You should just give her a window of like 30 minutes and everything should just start 30 minutes earlier. So she arrives on time. Boom. Just solve their relationship. (laughs) I know. I know. My husband's younger brother, he's always late. And so we always joke as a family that we tell everyone else what time something is starting, but we tell him a half hour earlier. (laughs) 
And it works, I'm yeah. sure. I have a friend uh, that we used to do that. She's like, you told me that it was 6.30 when it was really 7 on purpose. And we're like, yeah, we did. <laughs> so then she started catching on. So we had to do an hour early now. Oh. But yeah, that's the problem. Because once they catch on, then you have to add more time. <laughs> Um, because <laughs> it really doesn't work very well. Yeah. <laughs> but it makes you feel better. Yeah. So the next thing is to express appreciation frequently. So it's really important to avoid that steady criticism and um, to acknowledge your partner for the small things that they're doing. But I mean, really honest communication um, and to avoid the four big relationship killers, which are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, um, and what Dr. Gottman calls stonewalling or where you just shut down. Um, and actually it's interesting because this seems like there's a lot of people who grow up with families where, you know, criticism is kind of disguised as how I love you. I'm critical of you because I love you and I want you to be better rather than just appreciating them for who they are. And so people sometimes grow up with this belief system that, if you're critical of me, it's because you love me. And so then they look for partners who are critical of them. Um, I, I figured that out once I was dating somebody who, you know, he, ta- he always talked about how critical his ex-wife had been and I'm like, Oh, okay. And then uh, he was, we were dating and he had moved into this place and his mother was coming to visit and he was panicked about how he had to clean the bathroom. It had to be just so, and I'm looking at him like, your bathroom's fine. Mm. Like what? She's like, Oh no, this will not be good enough for my mother. She will, I will hear about it if it's not clean enough. And I'm going, Whoa. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) My attitude would have been if my mother had come over and told me the bathroom wasn't clean enough, I'd been like, well, you know, here's a bucket and a mop. Clean it yourself. (laughs) Or uh, yeah, there's that go poop outside. Have fun with that. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, if my bathroom's not good enough for you. Fine. But um, clearly that's not how he was raised. <laughs> um, and we would go out and he would come home and he would look at me like, so tell me everything I did wrong mm. this evening. And I'm going, what are you talking about? He's like, well, I, I'm sure I did things wrong. You have to tell me everything I did wrong. And that's when I realized it's like, oh, people grow up with this belief that they're constantly getting told everything they've done wrong mm-hmm. and how, how that equates to them that you love them enough, but it's not how it really works because a steady stream of criticism doesn't make us feel good about ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, there are studies that show that for every piece of criticism we give our partner, it takes five positive things to say to override that one criticism. Which when you think about it, if you're going to criticize your partner, then you're like, oh, crap, now I've got to come up with five good things to say. A lot of work. (laughs) A lot of work. (laughs) And and you see people all the time who are constantly criticizing each other. Um, I'm sure you've seen those couples. I know I've seen them where they're just snap sniping at each other and Um, i think that there's a way that you can express appreciation for to someone and give loving feedback without it being criticism without it feeling harsh right right yeah absolutely um and and giving those little appreciations for things you know that sometimes people think well i shouldn't have to say that they should just know that I, and it's like, well, if you don't say it, they don't. Mm-hmm. And it just feels so much better. You know, little things like, you know, thanks for making dinner tonight. That was really great. Or, oh, you know, I appreciate that you make the coffee every morning when you get up and I don't have to do it. And it's already there waiting for me. Or, um, you know, even something that you might have been fighting about if your partner's a workaholic um, and you're arguing because they're gone all the time. Well, maybe that's their way of showing you how much they love you. They work hard to create a good life for the family and maybe telling them how much you appreciate the hard work they do Mm -hmm. rather than criticizing that they're working all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It it might get a much different reaction from people. Mm -hmm. Um, And especially the contempt because contempt is that sense that you're you're saying something about something where you're better than them, you're above them, um, and you're really kind of giving them that sense of not being good enough. That is very destructive to a relationship. 
Mm -hmm. um, and the defensiveness. Uh, when you start to talk about something and the person immediately are like, oh yeah, really? Well, what about the time you did? It's like, no, no, no. We're not, <laughs> we're not going back five years to talk about something that happened then. You want to keep um, disagreements in the moment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Instead of trying to get all defensive and throw up things that they've done before, just deal with the thing you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, because that defensiveness will not get you good communication. Um, and then that stonewalling or that shutting down. Um, I always like to say that there's, there's three basic ways that couples deal with conflict. Um, it's either you come together and you deal with it sort of as a team. Like, okay, this is our problem. How are we going to deal with it? Or you turn against each other and now it's, it's one or the other's fault. Or you turn away from each other where you avoid it and you don't talk for days or sometimes weeks. And then the subject never gets brought up and it never gets resolved. Well, obviously the first one's the healthiest and the most helpful way of handling it. But again, what did you see your parents doing? So which is going to be your automatic thing to go to? Is it going to be to attack or turn away and shut down? Well, the more you keep turning away and shutting down or attacking, the more you're chipping away at the health of your relationship. So, and it's, it's not that difficult to start biting your tongue when you want to criticize and start finding things to appreciate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just takes a little bit of effort. Okay, time for a quick break. This podcast is made possible by Uber Lube. It's a luxurious silicone lubricant great for all kinds of sex. It's less likely to throw off the pH than most other lubes. And there are hundreds of doctors who recommend Uber Lube to their patients, whether they want to make their hot sex even hotter or for folks who are experiencing dryness. You never knew lube could be this good. So whether you're an avid lube lover or you've never used lube before, Uber Lube is right for you. It has no flavor, no scent, and feels absolutely amazing on the body. Uber Lube has endless uses. I use it to tame my hair frizzies, to prevent chafing, and I even put some in my mouth right before an oral sex session, and it totally ups my blowjob game. Oh, and the bottle, it's gorgeous. It's totally discreet and looks more like a beautiful cosmetic product, so you can even leave it on your nightstand shamelessly. To learn why we think it's the best lube on the planet, check out uberlube.com. Use code SHAMELESSSEX and you get 10% off and free shipping. That's uberlube.com. Go check it out. And now back to the show. Yeah, it's a, pra um, a practice. You know, the, the more we practice it, the easier it gets becomes the default. And if the folks who say, I'm not good at that, you're just, in my opinion, probably just out, out of practice. Right. Yeah. If you're not good at it, okay, not, that's a good thing to practice then. It's a good thing to work on. Um, because you, you can get good at it. Mm -hmm. Just because you're not good at it uh, doesn't mean you can't get good at it. Um, so the number three is communicate number three, not number two, <laughs> number three is communicate from integrity. So when your partner is right, just admit it. It is not the end of the world to admit that your partner's right about something. Um, yeah. And, and stop penalizing them for being honest. Um, so oftentimes you'll see people who, they want to say something to their partner about something, but they're afraid to say it because they know the person's going to get upset if they're just being honest. Um, I like to give the example of, you know, if your partner uh, decides to try a new recipe and it doesn't turn out very well and they ask you, so what do you think of it? It you was know? great. Just great. Loved it. Right. Yeah. Do you have to kind of lie and say it was great when actually it was you could barely choke it down oh. or can you laugh about it and be like, well, you know, not, not your best work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. um, but like, if you feel this hesitation of, Oh, if I say it's not their best work, they're going to get upset. They're going to be angry, whatever. Like now you're stopping your communication. Um, so you have to come to this place of agreeing to let each other just be honest with each other, not hurtfully honest. Um, 
you know, yeah, you know, you don't want to ask the question of, do these pants make me look fat? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like, well, don't ask the question if you don't want the answer. Uh, (laughs) Um, So don't set yourself up for it. Um, But it's okay to be honest and be like, yeah, okay, I, I get you're not, you know, you've put on a little weight, you're not looking as good as you want to, but you can fix that. It's, you know, you know, and then talk about it as rather than, oh, you don't love me anymore because I put on 10 pounds. Like, no, <laughs> you're kind of setting yourself up for having this communication problem that doesn't work well because you're not allowing them to just be honest with you when you ask the question. You could be like, babe, I really love you in that dress, actually. <laughs> or instead of the pants. <laughs> yeah. Those yeah. pants are nice. So what about this dress? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you dress better than that red dress. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to say how the red dress makes you look like, you know, a giant tomato. <laughs> it reminds me of April. You had, you had this jacket and you were like, hey, I love this jacket. My friend gave it to you. What do you think? And I was like, honestly, it reminds me of stylish grandma. <laughs> she was like, really? Are you serious? And I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry you asked. We just have different style, Chip. I'm sorry. And she's like, no. And then a couple hours later, she's like, yeah, it is kind of grandma <laughs> You know what? I'd be a stylish grandma and I'm happy about You're that. You're going to be a hot grandma, stylish and hot. Oh. I know a friend of mine on Facebook the other day, she's normally a blonde and she had dyed her hair red and she posted a picture of herself. And I mean, she's a gorgeous woman. I mean, this woman could wear a paper bag and look great, but everybody's going on about, oh, I love the red hair. And I'm looking at it going, do I say anything? Because I really think she looked better as a blonde but I don't want to be negative. Yeah. <laughs> and she didn't ask me personally for my opinion. So maybe I'll just keep it to myself. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I think it is helpful. Yeah. Especially if someone's not asking your opinion. And what I hear you say too, is like, you know, there's like the kind of pick your battles, right? If you're feeling like you're being oh, hypercritical all the time to be aware of that and to to share your feedback with someone that might potentially be hard for them to take in, knowing when, when it feels like it's really necessary, because if, if it's just constant, then there's the shutdown can happen. Uh, but also you don't want to do a complete withholding. No, you don't want to do complete this withholding or not really being honest. But oftentimes that constant criticism is, is hiding. What are you really upset about in the relationship? Like if you're criticizing this and this and this and this, it's like, okay, what are you not saying that is truly the issue that's going on? Um, and I've certainly found that in myself when if I've, I hear myself being this not very nice person, it's usually nothing about what's actually going on. It's more about all the stuff that we're not talking about that I'm really upset about. <laughs> um, and so I figured that out through life that, okay, let's just talk about the stuff that's really there. Um, and then the next one is you want to share and explore differences with your partner. So you want to explore disagreements and move towards a resolution that really accepts both parts of you. So many times when we get into the conflicts, we have this, we've been taught to that it's this win-lose sort of battle. Um, and each person's like, I have to win, which then means your, your partner has to lose which doesn't feel very good when you get into conflicts if you're, if you're literally going into battle every time, uh, where if you look at it as more as how can we have a win-win such solution? How can we both get some of what we want um, rather than this, I've, I've got to, and which then for some people means that they have to fight dirty in order to win. Um, and some people don't really understand the difference between what's a, a difference of opinion and a disagreement. Um, An example I like to give people is like, if if you like dogs and your partner likes cats, well, you have a difference of opinion. But if you insist that your partner who likes dogs has to like cats instead, well, now you have a disagreement. You know, it's like, okay, you you can have differences, but how do you deal with those differences? And when you're confronted with them, how much of it is your own hurt size that if, well, if you don't like cats, then you don't love me. And no, (laughs) that's not what it's about at all. 
Um, and then next is you want to support your partner's goals. Um, and this is important that you do that without surrendering your own goals and beliefs. Um, it's not that sort of, I, I think for a lot of time as women, we tend to get caught up in this that we're supposed to, if we have male partners, we're supposed to support their goals and it's, you know, help them achieve their goals, whatever it is. And, and our goals aren't really that important. Um, it's probably more of a 1950s and 60s view than it is currently, but we still- Oh, no, I, I know people that are of all ages that are still in that mindset. Oh, yeah. It is still, it's an easy mindset to get into because I think as, as women, we're so trained on that one. We're so trained that their, their goals are more important. Um, and so it's, it's certainly important to support their goals, but that doesn't mean you have to give up your own goals in the process because it becomes way too one-sided uh, when you do that. Um, and it doesn't even necessarily mean you have to agree all the way with their goals. Now, it also kind of depends on what their goals are. Um, you know, if their their goals are to be the next mafia don, okay, maybe you don't necessarily want to really support this illegal and unethical type of behavior. And also, I, I mean, just... I was thinking about if you are focused on supporting your partner's goals and putting yours on the complete back burner, you risk the, the, you risk the fact that you could have some resentment coming up and that could create a rift between the relationship for, for not honoring your own goals. It's great to honor your partners and just to consider what, what you would like as well. I've seen that many times and it's happened to me in, in some of my relationships. You start to resent them and you don't know why, but you kind of do. So I think it's probably really important to honor your own needs and, and objectives. Absolutely. And, and to remember that <clears throat> goals change over time. You know, when you, when people get into new relationships and you're dating and you're getting to know each other, often people start talking about what are their goals? What do they want to do in life? Where do they want to be in five, 10 years? And then they get on this path together and they stop talking about, well, what are the goals? It's like, they're not written in stone. And they change and evolve as you live. And if you don't keep talking about them every so often about, hey, you know, because it's a great topic to occasionally sit down with your partner and be like, you know, where I, this is where we're at right now. And what are you thinking about in the next five years? Um, or what, where do you see ourselves when we retire? Because, you know, some people might see retirement as, oh, great, we're going to travel the world. And somebody else is going to be like, no, I want to start a new business. And, I, you know, I leave that corporate job and start my own business. And I, that's how I want to spend my retirement. And if the other partner is going, are you kidding? You're going to work until you drop? Like, uh, no, I was going to move to Phoenix and play golf. You know? <laughs> and the other one's bored to tears by the thought of moving to Phoenix and playing golf. So it's good to keep checking in with each other on all that stuff because they do change. Um, and the next is to give your partner the right to be wrong. Um, you know, I think people so forget that as human beings, we're designed to be fallible. Like that's making mistakes is how we learn as human beings. Um, and that we're not meant to do everything right the first time. Um, if you accidentally do something right the first time, you really didn't learn much. But if you had to fail and figure out, okay, that didn't work so well, maybe I need to tweak this and do something different, you learn and you grow. Where if we don't let our partner be wrong, we're not allowing them to grow. And we're not allowing them to evolve. We're teaching them that somehow it's bad to be wrong. Which usually means that we teach our kids the same thing. Which are not things you really want to pass on to your kids. <laughs> No. Um, and I, I used to, I, I frequently I'll teach people about when they're, they're thinking about, well, but I, you know, I can't be wrong. And, and people have a big issue with being wrong. Um, and I'll talk with them about how I want you to think about um, if either if they can remember back to when they watched maybe a young a younger sibling, or if they've had children, and they've watched them grow up. It's like, remember back when your kid was a baby. Okay, at first they started learning to crawl, but they didn't do it very well at first. 
you know, they might've gotten up on their, their little hands and little arms and legs and they went to move the first arm and then they fell on their face. And then they got back up again and, you know, they, like they're trying to figure out how to move these things to make themselves go forward. They don't just get up and go. It's the series of getting up, falling down, getting up, falling down. And at that point, babies don't ever think about going, this is just too hard. You know, I, I see all you people walking around, but I, I clearly am humiliating myself trying to, I keep falling down and forget it. You people are just going to carry me for the rest of my life. Babies don't do that, but somewhere along the way, we teach them that it's humiliating or embarrassing to make a mistake and be wrong. Mm -hmm. And so then as adults, we don't, we don't really thrive because we stop, we stop pushing ourselves. Or we try to avoid wrongness altogether or, or failure or not doing things perfectly. And then people get in their own way and a lot of things don't get done. And like you said, they don't push themselves. They don't try the new thing or when they do uh, fail or like, you know, so what happens with marriage, mar relationships and marriages, you know, my, I fail, I failed marriage and I messed up. And, and, and then if living in that feeling of thinking that you're not good enough because things didn't work out perfectly um, can just feel super limiting for how people can actually continue to grow and expand. I know for myself, I've had to do a lot of work around uh, wrongness and, um, and em embracing that. And like you said, knowing that that's part of the path, part of the learning. And I love what you said about thinking of, of children and, and pretty much everything that we as adults had to learn to, to function in this world had to come from some trial and error. Right. And, you know, it, re it relates not only to your communication, your relationship, or that sense of, oh, if this relationship ends and it's failed and I've somehow failed as a person because I wasn't a good enough partner or I wasn't a good enough husband or wife or it's like I, I always try and tell people if just because you got divorced or broke up doesn't mean you failed you know and maybe that relationship wasn't meant to work long term and what did you learn from it what did you gain from it rather than how you're beating yourself up about how it's not continuing on like you know maybe they were kind of a jerk and you learn to stand up for yourself and find somebody who treats you better. That's a positive. That's a good thing that you finally got out of this relationship that was not happy rather than you failed. So, yeah. Um, and then the last one is to reconsider your wants as goals to achieve later. Um, so, and, and that's a nice one that kind of works well with the other um, six guidelines, because if you, if you reconsider them as goals, rather than I have to have this thing, you know, we don't always get what we want out of life. And if you take that pressure off yourself that I have to have this, you have to change in this way. This has to be different now. No, it doesn't. And you know, maybe you can rethink of this as a long range goal of Oh, well, you know, it would be nice if we communicated better. Um, it would be nice if our sex life was better. Um, you know, it's kind of like going back to the mistake thing. People shut down in their sex lives because they're too afraid of it not working well. And then their partner being disappointed or angry or looking at them as not good enough as a partner, as a lover. And so they don't, they don't try. Um, I often like to tell people that sex is this huge buffet of different things that are on it. And most people in their relationships get into this rut of they go to the buffet and every time they take the same things off of it. Well, one, that can be very boring. I mean, oh my God. like I love a burger and fries, but I do not want a burger and fries three meals a day. Like, no. And so if you think about your sexual buffet, what else can you go and take off of it? What else might be different that you haven't tried or you haven't tried in a long time? Um, and, and how can you look at sex between the two of you as this, it doesn't have to look the way you think it always is going to because people forget that throughout life, 
you know, to have a good, healthy sex life, it's going to change. Uh, sex at 50 is not going to look like sex at 20. And thankfully so. <laughs> you know, we don't want it to look the same way. We want it to ebb and flow and evolve. But that means you also have to take those risks and you've got to let each other stumble and let it be awkward and take chances. And if it doesn't work, be able to look at each other and be like, oh, wow, that, that was not fun. Uh, <laughs> you know, rather than being angry with your partner because it, it wasn't magic. Like, you know, you kind of have to remember that for most of us, the first time we had sex, it was not magic. Uh, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, very few people I've ever asked that question to have said it was magic. Um, except an ex-boyfriend who, when I asked him that question, I found out that I was his first. Uh, <laughs> the answer better be yes then, right? now. <laughs> no, I would have been fine, but I'm just going... Whoa, you're telling me this two months later that I was your first? Okay. Surprise! Surprise! Special. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, well, yeah. do you cover the guidelines deeper in your book for folks? The book, uh, No More Hiding, Permission to Love Your Sexual Self? Or is this a separate kind of thing they can access through your website? Um, I... I I have some pieces online on uh, my Facebook page that are videos where I cover it. I like, I broke it down to where I take each one of those for a day and talk about them. Um, and so those videos are online. If you go to my Facebook page, um, it's just called Dr. Rhoda and people can access it there. It's also on my YouTube channel, uh, which is Dr. Rhoda Lipscomb. And you can see all of the seven guidelines there. It's the book is a, a little bit more uh, a little different that it's more about um, helping people kind of guide themselves when they have these different uh, types of sexual desires, whether it's open relationships or various kinks or fetishes or BDSM. And th they want them, but they're not quite sure how to get to that place where they can truly be authentic in themselves. Um, you know, they've spent years hiding these things. They, they, they don't know how to talk about them. And it's kind of helping them through that process of going, really, this is okay. You're not um, a sexual pervert because you like BDSM or, you know, you like a certain, you have a shoe fetish or whatever it is. And I know you're a sexuality coach and a sex therapist. Do you work, are you taking new clients or patients? And if so, can you let our listeners know how they can find you and work with you? Um, yes, I am. And even though, I mean, as a psychotherapist, I can only work with people in the state of Colorado because that's where I'm licensed. But as a sexuality coach, I can work with people all over the country. And actually, I've even worked with people from a few other countries. So um, that is always a, an access for people who, if they've heard something they like and they want to get in touch with me, um, they can always go to my website, which is drrota.com. And that's probably the easiest way. And um, or send me an email, uh, which is Rhoda at drrhoda.com. Um, and either way is fine. And just, you know, let's just start having a conversation. Um, sometimes it's, it may be a matter of we're not the right fit and maybe I need to refer you to somebody else. Um, and that's fine. But some people will be like, oh, no, you're, you're my person. You're the one I want to work with. I'd be like, great. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm here for. I took so much from this episode and I actually took a bunch of notes while you were speaking and I just want to say thank you. I think you may have, uh, or I may have forgotten one of the eighth guidelines, which I wanted to share, which is why not get your partner some great wine? Go to marginswine.com. That's the eighth and forgotten one. And uh, check out your and support your local Santa Cruz winemaker because Megan Bell's been making wine. She's talented, gifted. It's boutique, beautiful wine. And your partner and probably you will love it. Helps to get through your quarantine, I hope. So check out her site. Sign up for a newsletter now. And absolutely wonderful speaking with Dr. Rhoda Lipscomb. I think that you have some excellent, excellent, tools here. And I want to start to apply them. Now I'm going to make a little uh, note to have on my, my mirror, because I think I forget sometimes how to, how to show up and be an amazing partner. And we can all do a little bit more to show up 
within ourselves and for each other. And so um, thank you so much, Dr. Rhoda. Thank you for being here with us. And to all of our listeners out there, thank you for being part of the shameless sex revolution. Go ahead, just log on to iTunes and give us five stars. It just helps more people further, better their relationships and themselves and their sex lives and their pleasure. And we love you for it. And we love absolutely each and every one of you. We'll see you next Tuesday. And remember, we're also on Fridays. Ciao for now. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com.